geomorphology at the University of Washington, and I'm one of the parties responsible for this trilogy about soil. Uh, the other party was my wife, Anne McClay, who talked about The Hidden Half of Nature a little earlier, so I'm not going to talk much about that book, because she just did. But I am going to talk a bit about the dirt book and a lot more about Growing Revolution, the new book. Um, why would a geologist write a trilogy about soil? Um, that is part of what I want to get across today and fill you in on that for um, those of you who may not have read all three books yet. I'll give you the, sort of the, the two or three that, through them. Of course I'm going to recommend them to you. That's why uh, people write. They like to share ideas. Uh, and the idea that really got me into looking at the um, uh, you know, soil as something worth talking about outside of the classroom that I teach in at, at the University of Washington was basically the idea that global soil degradation is really a truly underappreciated global crisis. Um, and I started looking into the problem of soil degradation as I wrote the dirt book. You know, it came out 10 years ago, so it's been a little while that it's been out. But what, one of the things geologists do is we look back through Earth history. And I wanted to look back through just the last 10,000 years of history, the human part of Earth history, or the post-agriculture part of human history. And I was really interested in the way soil erosion had affected ancient societies. But what I ended up doing is writing a history of farming, because it turns out uh, that a lot of you can view the history of humanity through this lens of farming practices and the way that farming practices have degraded soils in societies around the world. Um, and to what extent are soils degraded around the world? Well, I'll refer to the UN's global map of soil degradation. It's been out a fair while now. Uh, and it's, a fairly, it's painting with a fairly broad brush. You'll notice that there's a lot of uh, degraded and very degraded soils in the world, uh, pretty much everywhere outside of the, the polar regions, which um, you know, what may happen to all the carbon locked up in there in the future is a whole other question I'm not going to talk about today. But you'll notice, uh, I'd like to point out that within each of those red zones on this map, those areas have really degraded soils. You can go find farms that are building fertile soils, that are improving soil health. That's where I want to get to by the end of this talk. As I wrote the dirt book, I really struggled with the last chapter in it. Because as you look back through the history of societies around the world, it's easy to get depressed about what we've done to the soil. It's a lot harder to be optimistic. But I managed to get there. It took me a decade. But I managed to get there, and that's where I'm at. But we'll get there through the course of this talk, too. So the first uh, few slides are a little depressing. Well, they should be. Um, I hope you'll feel better by the end of the talk. What's the state of the world's soils? You know, that, that global map of soil degradation is a powerful visual. But how much soil have we lost in relatively recent time? Um, David Pimentel and his colleagues at Cornell back in the 1990s estimated that um, you know, since the Second World War, soil erosion and soil degradation, the sort of the two the twin uh, uh, processes that can uh, impact the soil cause farmers to abandon some 430 million hectares of arable land. That's about the size of China and India combined. It's about a third of the available crop land we have at the end of the second world war. Think about how much simpler the problem of feeding the world in the future would be if we still had that one third of our agricultural land at its native fertility. The pro how you rebuild soil fertility in my view, is one of the great underappreciated and under-talked about policy issues we need to wrestle with, not just in this country, but around the world over the next century. And so the question, I wanted to ask the question, can we do it? The UN, last year, two years ago, basically estimated that every year we lose about a third of a percent, 0.3 percent, of our global food production capacity every year due to ongoing soil erosion and degradation. And that's cumulative. So every year we lose another 0.3%. And geologists like to think of centuries as really, really fast. They're kind of round off error on geologic time. But if you forecast that number out for a century, it doesn't bode well for how we're going to be able to feed the world of tomorrow. This is a problem that, frankly, must be solved. We have to turn this number around and make it positive rather than negative. And the history of this, I wrote about um, in Dirt, um, looking at the role that soil erosion and degradation have played in ancient societies. I'm going to give you sort of the, the short summary of that book so I can move on to the other two as well. But basically the idea is that soil erosion played a really important role 
in the demise of ancient civilizations, going back all the way to, uh, well, actually to Mesopotamia, um, uh, the areas around the Middle East, uh, Neolithic Europe, Classical Greece, Rome, Southern United States, Central America, and more that I went through in that book. And that was a geologist's way to essentially catalog and look at what had been the effect of how people treated the land on the way the land could treat human societies. And the short answer is that societies that did not treat their land well, the land did not support them over long periods of time. Um, and I compiled basically the, the data, the arguments, going in through archaeology, um, looking at the story, and I hadn't thought of this at the start of the book. That's one of the nice things about writing books the way I do, is that I have a general idea of where I'm trying to go, and then I do a whole lot of research and figure out what the story really was, and I only know the story once I've finished the book. Um, that keeps it fun, both for me and hopefully for readers and my wife and co-author as well, uh, but in the Dirt book, if a nonfiction book can actually have a villain, that villain was the plot, because that is essentially what had helped take down society after society that relied on the plot. Now, the plow is actually really good weed control. It actually gives you a little burst of fertility as you burn up that organic matter and the microbes process it and get those micronutrients out of the organic matter and into your crop. But if you keep plowing, and you do it for generations, you burn up your organic matter. You can actually lose the soil itself. There's areas that I've gone out to in North Carolina that um, Rio Trilletta took me around to a couple years ago where the farmers are farming the bee horizon. For those of you who are soil scientists, you know, the A horizon is gone. There's no topsoil left. They're, it's been plowed off, and they're farming the subsoil. That's not where the fertility tends to reside. Your problem with soil erosion is you're eroding off the top, and it's that topsoil where fertility, where is that is the real engine, the biological engine of fertility. So, fun, um, the plow fundamentally altered the balance between soil erosion and production on the land on which we depend on to grow our food. It caused erosion to happen faster than the soils naturally rebuilt. Now, as an academic, I wanted to, after having compiled those stories of ancient civilizations, ask the question, well, how much modern data do we have that looks at this problem? And what's the pace at which soil loss can degrade uh, soils? And so do the numbers pencil out that this idea that soil erosion and degradation had impacted ancient societies actually might hold water. So what I did is something that's actually gotten very difficult to, uh, to get um, a lot of my students to have the safety stage to do, and that is I went to the library. And I went there for, th for three weeks, and all I did was vacuum up papers and data and try and compile rates of soil erosion, both long-term, long-term geological rates, because if you think about landscapes that have soil on them, the rate that the soil's eroding can't be any more or less, it's got to be about in balance with the rate that the rocks are being turned into soil, otherwise you'd have, if the soil production was much faster than the rocks broke down, you'd have thick piles of soil, we only have about a foot to three feet of soil in most places around the planet, and alternatively, geologic time is long enough that if natural soil erosion rates were faster than natural soil production rates, you wouldn't have soil anywhere, because you've got plenty of time for it to play out. So I compiled the long-term geological rates and also looked at modern agricultural rates. Because if you look at the farmers in Rome, or say Greece, or even the Neolithic farmers, in, uh, wherever in the world, there were not geomorphologists like myself out there. There's no data from those times. You have to triangulate it from reading the archeological literature and sort of put it all together. Today, we have lots of people around the world measuring soil erosion. So I compiled all this data, and I'm gonna boil it down to a single table for you. If you really want the data, I published it all in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences back in 2007. There's an Excel table in there. No one should ever have to redo this compilation. Just go steal my data, use it, and take it. So basically, you've got the type of measurement on the left, the rate in millimeters per year on the right. And sorry, I am metric, so I'll do everything in millimeters. Uh, conventional farming, uh, no-till farming, native vegetation, rates of soil production, long-term geological rates of erosion. These numbers in parentheses are the number of academic studies that are involved in those averages. So, you know, there's like, you know, 400 and some odd uh, studies of conventional erosion. From, and this is tillage-based practices from around the world. And you'll notice that those blue numbers are a lot smaller than that red number. That's the basic message of this graph, or the, this data. Um, that conventional tillage-based farming 
causes soil erosion. At, you know, a millimeter and a half a year, this is a global average. The number's actually vary quite widely. It's a distribution. But if you, on average, soils are eroding a millimeter and a half a year off of our farm fields around the world. How fast is soil being built? Well, you know, you can build it up at, you know, tenth of a millimeter a year. Or, or I'm sorry, a couple percent of a millimeter a year. Long-term rates of soil erosion or native vegetation are about equal to rates of soil production, as you would expect, as I was talking about a minute ago. Long-term geological erosion rates, about the same. Look at the soil erosion rate for no-till agriculture. I can't argue to you, given how crude this kind of compilation is, that that number is any different from those long-term natural numbers. In other words, the problem with soil degradation through erosion is not that we farm. And that would be a horrible conclusion to come to. We, at that point, we just kind of say, okay, you know, let's just party until the, end, the soil runs out, and then the crows take over or something, I don't know. Um, the good news is that we have farming practices that can curtail soil erosion and bring it back down to rates that are comparable with rates of natural soil building. And as I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes, we can actually build soils faster than nature does because we kind of know the tricks, we know how to do it. And I've visited farmers around the world who have been doing this. So the good news is that the problem isn't that we farm, the problem is how we farm. We need to fundamentally rethink our agricultural principles and practices um, if we are to avoid the fate of ancient civilizations that literally burned through their topsoil. Uh, and just to, to take the, the argument in the dirt book to its natural conclusion, if you take that net topsoil loss of about a millimeter or so a year, and recall the global average is a millimeter and a half, I'm going to be conservative, let's we'll say give me a millimeter a year difference between that red number and the previous thing, all those blue numbers. You play that out and you could erode a half, mil, a half meter to one meter thick, about a one to three foot thick soil, which is typical, go to the UN Global Soil Database, that's what tends to be on hill slopes around the world. a politician or to a secretary of agriculture. <laughs> but to a geologist, that's screamingly fast. A few centuries. And you go and look at what we did to the eastern seaboard in the Piedmont country, where the egg horizons are gone after 200 years of colonial agriculture. You look what the Romans did to central Italy, where the port of Rome is now miles inland because of all the soil that got washed off the hills of Italy, created the Pontine marshes, and filled the, you know, advanced out into the sea, stranding a port miles from the shore. You don't build a port inland. Um, and that time scale of you know, a few centuries to a thousand years is approximately the time scale of most major agricultural civilizations with one huge class of exceptions. And that is the major flood, the river, the river based major floodplain civilizations in the Tigris and Euphrates, in the Nile, in the Indus and the Brahmaputra, the river below, rivers of lowland China the big alluvial rivers, um, the, the Mekong, these big rivers where you are able to actually farm on the floodplain over the long term, even with, whether with a plow or not, because the annual flooding of the river is, re is delivering fresh mineral elements from the soils eroded, you guessed it, off the upland. If you want to go find some relatively impoverished areas of the world today, go upstream of those major civilizations that have listened, existed for a long time. Go to the Zagros Mountains in uh, you know, north of Mesopotamia, go to Sudan and Ethiopia, north, uh, south of the Nile, go to the, the Himalaya, uh, go to um, the eastern Tibet. These are areas where the soils have been degraded over the long run, and these major civilizations downstream were in effect subsidized by all that soil eroded off of them and delivered to the major agricultural regions along this main river floodplain. So the societies that have, have thrived for thousands of years agriculturally in the same piece of land Pretty much they're doing it in areas where you would expect that kind of um, naturally regenerative um, floodplain deposition. The problem, of course, is that not the whole world, the whole world is not floodplain. And so as societies expanded out of floodplains and up onto the hillsides where soil erosion was a major problem, the clock started ticking in terms of how long they had to be able to farm in those areas before they were compromised. So this brings up the question of is soil restoration possible? Can we actually reverse the historical pattern? And you know, I probably, if I came up with the answer of no, we're all doomed, I would have stopped writing. Because <laughs> that would be a really depressing conclusion to actually come to. So how did I actually start to turn my thinking around? Well, it was in great part due to my wife, Anne McClay, and her activities in our yard, our garden, our now garden, our formerly sort of uh, biological desert of a lot. Um, 
And I'm not going to give you a whole lot about this book because you literally just talked about it. We've got copies here if anyone's interested. You can always read it. It's much better than listening to me talk about it. Um, but what the basic story is, is that when I got tenure at the University of Washington, we realized that, wow, we finally saved up enough money. We might go buy a house. So we did. And we bought a house in North Seattle. And the lot basically came with a what I like to call an old growth lawn. <laughs> it was literally 90 years old. The people that we bought it from, the people that had built it originally, had you know just put in a lawn. And if you dug down into it, it was just all roots for about six inches. When we peeled that lawn off to start build, making the garden that Anne really wanted to have, because we've been living in grad student housing for years, where we just we didn't have a place where she could garden. She has she's a plant whisperer. She has a green thumb. I don't. I, I watch what she does and do what she tells me in the yard. Um, but she really wanted to start building her dream garden. And I was like, yeah. Um, we peeled that lawn off, and what we have? Really rich black earth. No. We had glacial till. We had the horrible, crappy dirt. I mean, we had, there was not a single worm living in this stuff when we peeled it off. We did not see a macroscopic life form. I'm sure there were some microbes in it, but there weren't very many. And this got Anne into. Um, you know, well, we both realized that what we had is half the equation for fertile soil. What, do you, what makes soil fertile? It's the marriage of geology and biology. And simply by coincidence, Anne's a biologist, I'm a geologist, so again, we, 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 uh, we like that analogy. <laughs> but it's actually accurate. You need the mineral matter for nutrition, and you need the biology. Both the organic matter, the formerly living things, the dead stuff, but you also need the living organisms the current biology to reprocess that, to get those elements out of the mineral particles, to get them out of the organic matter, and get them back into circulation to help support the plants. So what basically uh, Anne's working on herself to do is to try and uh, run what we call an organic matter crusade, which is to get as much organic matter as we could back into our yard from every source we could. And that's all detailed in the hidden half of nature. She just gave a big talk on it, so I'll go into the details, but I'll show you the product of what she did. This is what we started with. That's what we have today. This had about half a percent organic matter. On average, our yard is up to about eight, nine, ten percent, depending on sort of where you measure it. And that's you know, it's many tons of carbon sequestered in our yard. Now, we have, there's a lot more work that needs to be done globally, obviously. But the point is, we did this in a decade. This is fast. To a geologist, that's like snapping your fingers and getting it done. This, to me, was really exciting. Because it suggested that, wow, if the time scale for rebuilding fertile soil can be done that fast, how do you do it at scale? You know, if you can do it in, a, in an urban lot in North Seattle, how do you do it on subsistence farms in Africa? How do you do it on huge commodity crop operations uh, across North America? That's basically what I tried to take on in Growing a Revolution. Um, and the book just came out this last May or June. Um, and Basically, the, you'll notice the color difference on these two tubes of soil over there on the right that are from Ratan Lal's uh, long-term no-till uh, studies at Ohio State University. Should remind you of the color difference in our yard. This is essentially no-till farming with, without cover crops or manure. This is what 20 years of adding organic matter did to the soil. Getting, and, and, you, and in soil, you can take darkness, you can take the blackness of the soil as a first-order indicator of its carbon content. Um, now, if we look at the problem of feeding the world over the next century, yeah, it is a daunting problem. We're going to have about 3 billion more people, uh, by all estimates, coming, uh, coming along down the road. And we also, if you look at what we rely on to grow food today, it's dominantly a fossil fuel-based system. And if there's one thing that all the estimates of the availability of at least oil and gas share, is that at some point, our supply is going to diminish. And as we keep finding more, these curves get shifted around a bit. But you know, if you think like a geologist, the difference between you know sliding down this curve now versus 20 years from now, that's like no time at all. And so we have this problem now where we, we are facing a, 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 a demographically inevitable rise in global population with a resource inevitable decline in the way that in our ability to grow food the way we do today. In other words, something is going to have to change in the next 100 years of agriculture. The question is what? 
And it's my contention that rebuilding soil fertility would be one of the most useful things we could do for sustaining agriculture in a post-cheap oil and fertilizer world. Because as we start to run low on gas and oils at some point in the future, whether by design and policy or whether by the simply the you know, burning through it all, um, it's going to become increasingly difficult to sustain agriculture without rebuilding soil fertility. So can we do this at scale? How might we do it? If we we're, were able to do it, it would literally account for a new agricultural revolution. And that's the argument I make in Growing a Revolution, and thus the title. Um, how could we actually turn around this long-term problem of soil degradation and rebuild the fertility of our land? Well, it's useful, I think, to think about agriculture as having gone through a series of four revolutions so far. Um, the first was the basic idea of cultivation in the first place. And this is the, the, the Greek goddess of cereals series that um, I just like the image, so I use her. There's lots of goddesses and gods of fertility from around the world. Um, but the idea behind cultivation in the first place was really the first agricultural revolution, the idea that we could actually stay in one place and grow a lot of things. And as I talk about in the Dirt Book, um, at least in the roots of Western agriculture, back in the, uh, Mesopotamia, you know, shortly after the end of the last ice age, there's pretty solid archeological evidence that agriculture wasn't sort of done because it was seen as an opportunity. It was done out of desperation. The environment literally changed out from underneath the people living in that area, and they had to figure out how to eat grasses because that's what was left. Uh, I go all through that in the dirt book. I'll spare you the details. The second agricultural revolution was really something that happened in different places around the world at different times, but with, and it's independently just rediscovered by many um, societies. And that's the ideas of soil husbandry, crop rotation, uh, letting livestock graze on crop stubble in the fields to manure the fields. The whole idea of how you actually would build fertility was something that a lot of people in a lot of cultures around the world developed their own methods of doing. Planting legumes to, to get, you know, no one knew about nitrogen at the time, but they knew that it actually boosts the fertility of soil. Um, this is rediscovered around the world, and it's my favorite quote from Leonardo da Vinci that I think is as true today as it was 500 years ago. We know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. We are just learning and relearning what makes fertile soil? What is fertility? When I was taught soil science, uh, it was mostly about chemistry and physics. And as Ray Archuleta was talking about this morning, biology is the third dimension. And I think that we've kind of undersold that in the 20th and so far in the 21st century in the sense that the biology is the key to unlocking the chemistry and the physics to actually build fertility. The third um, agricultural revolution was no doubt, mechanization and industrialization, the, the growth of the fertilizer industry with its patron Saint Justice von uh, Liebig as um, a character who will reappear in a moment. Um, but the idea that we could actually ramp up and scale up agriculture. And in the process, we tended to treat soil as the cheapest of the inputs into the agricultural production process, to the point where for much of the 20th century, it was viewed as essentially a medium in which to grow plants, as opposed to the source of the fertility that we could used to grow plants. Um, and I want to just do a sidebar on Liebig, because one of the things that I learned about him in researching Growing the Revolution is that he actually wrote two really good books. His early book on the role of fertilizers from the 1840s you know, really kicked off the intellectual revolution that led to the growth of the modern fertilizer industry. But at the end of his life, in 1863, he wrote another book. And it was called The Natural Laws of Husbandry. And in it, he recommended returning organic matter to the fields to provide crops with a full complement of nutrients. He quite explicitly said that if you fertilize with only one or two elements, you will run out of all the other elements that the plants really need for health, and it won't be sustainable. He didn't use quite those words, right? It was in the late 19th century, but it's very clear. He went so far as to advocate the recycling of municipal sewage to take it back to the fields that that food was grown on to close the loop. He, he came up with the idea of closing the loop in terms of nutrient cycling. Um, and ironically, I, the, the, his disciples that carried his sort of fertilizer message forward, I think probably didn't get around to reading his last book. Um, and I never would have guessed from my knowledge of the history of that until I actually read it and was like, wow, this guy actually really got it. Um, the fourth agricultural revolution, I, I lumped the green revolution and biotechnology into sort of a, a single uh, revolution there, uh, the sort of the late 20th century, and there's no doubt that um, you know uh, developing 
fertilizer friendly crops uh, and the whole development of the Haber-Bosch process that allowed the fixation of nitrogen uh, uh, synthetically, you know, it raised crop yields globally. It allowed us to grow a lot more food. The thing that Ann and I are coming to realize is that in focusing on quantity, we've kind of overlooked the issue of quality of food. And we're actually working on our new book now that is holding the projector up, uh, as you can see the state that it's in. Um, is that we're working on the relationship between soil health and human health as mediated through the quality of food that it produces. Um, but the fifth revolution is the one that I um, would like to call something like the soil health revolution. Lots of people call it different things. Howard G. Buffett calls it the Brown Revolution. Uh, we call it the soil health revolution. Maybe it needs a name, maybe it doesn't. The key thing is that if we start thinking about soil building practices through the lens of soil health, we can revolutionize agriculture because we have not been doing that. People in the biodynamic world, the organic world, have been thinking about these things for a long time. And the kinds of things that, say, Sir Albert Howard and Lady Eve Balfour, two of the real giants of the early organic food movement, did not have. Well, what they did have was insight. What they did not have, and they had experience, they had observations. What they didn't have is the science of microbial ecology that underpins the role of biology and fertility was not known then. There were pieces of it, there were inklings of it, but the science really didn't come along to validate their arguments until long after their day. We're at the point now where a lot of that science is actually coming around and reinforcing points that they made based on intu intuition and observation. Um, and adopting those, that new science into the world of agriculture would revolutionize it. So what I did is I visited farms around the world that had rebuilt the health of their soil, they rebuilt the carbon content, the fertility of their soil, um, and basically saw how adopting the principles that can be lumped un under the label of conservation agriculture um, could match conventional yields using far less oil and chemical inputs. Most of the farmers I visited are not organic farmers. I did visit some, but most of them were not, and that was by design, um, as I'll go through um, as we get there, because most of the world's farmers are in developed, or at least are conventional farmers. What are those principles of conservation agriculture? They really boil down to three simple ideas. Don't disturb the soil. So plant direct, go no-till. Ditch the plow. Have a permanent <coughs> ground cover, retain cover crop residues, and include cover crops and rotations, particularly legumes. This is an ancient idea. This is not a new idea. This is ancient wisdom. Uh, it's new to use it with no-till. And the third one, diversify crops into, in complex rotations. Don't just grow, say, corn and soy. One of my favorite quotes out of the book. Can you have a favorite quote out of your own book? I guess you can. Um, one of my favorite quotes out of the Growing Revolution book is, corn soy is not a rotation. Um, <laughs> feel, feel free to steal that. Um, but you know, the, uh, having a diverse rotation, at least three or four crops, can break up the, the pest and pathogen carryover problem. But it also can help get different micronutrients out of the soil. You want a variety of plants tapping with their microbial partners different elements out of the soil to get them into biological circulation and a diversity of plants either in the field along with the crop or in time between crops is a way to do that. So these three principles turn out to be the common elements of all the farmers that I visited around the world. They scale from small farms to large farms. They scale with technology. You, do, you can do it with hardly any capital or you can do it with really expensive equipment. Uh, the principles are the same, but the practices you would use in different environments are different. And what I think we need to do is, well, what I would argue is that this fifth agricultural revolution that I'm hoping is just coming over history's horizon is really a revolution in how we think about soil, how we think about our farming practices. Because if we think differently about something, we'll start to act differently. We'll start to realize that, oh, maybe I shouldn't be plowing that field or rototilling my garden. Um, so how does no-till work? Uh, for those who haven't seen some of the, the neat sort of large-scale machinery that allowed no-till planting on um, large acreages in the United States, this is uh, David Brandt, a farmer who will uh, uh, reappear in a few minutes, sort of uh, uh, modeling, if you will, um, his no a no-till planter. And the basic idea is that you attach this thing behind your tractor, and so it drives this way. This wheel cuts a trench in the soil, it basically separates the crop residue from the last crop, so it spreads it, digs a little trench, you drop a seed down into that hole, you know, every so often, and then these closing wheels cover it back up. What this shows you is a freshly planted field. 
Now compare that in your mind's eye to what you, if you followed up behind a plow. You can barely tell this was disturbed. There's these little trenches with seeds. And the beauty of this technique is that all this residue from the previous crop is now a mulch. And so you've planted and mulched in one pass. In terms of cover crops, there's other techno simple technologies that I think, again, I think Ray probably showed earlier. Uh, this is Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute. They were the organic farmers that I visited. Um, and he's got their design of a, a roller crimper that you would put on the front of your tractor. So you have your no-till planter on the back, you have the roller crimper on the front, and what this does is it can knock down a cover crop. So if you have a cover crop growing in your field and you basically knock it down, it'll pin the stems between this, these blades in the ground, you crimp the stem of a plant, you've killed it, uh, you've basically turned it into mulch. So you mulch, and that mulching, since it's organic matter, that will decay and get down into the soil, you've mulched and fertilized and planted with one pass. That's a third of the, you know, half the diesel use. What are the big expenses for farmers today? Diesel and agrochemicals. Oil in various forms. Uh, so I started visiting uh, other farmers as well. This is Dwayne Beck at the uh, Dakota Lakes Research Farm in South Dakota, uh, which if you'll notice on the cover of the dirt book, there's that, that classic Dust Bowl era image of abandoned farm equipment with sand blowing across it. Um, this is the same region. Uh, and one of the reasons I went to visit Wayne is that he's sort of in the heart of the country that that photograph was taken from, you know, ground zero for part of the Dust Bowl. He took me on a 300 mile drive around the area where he lives, uh, and I saw three plowed fields during plowing season. They've gone almost all no-till. And Wayne runs a research farm that is essentially looking at, well, how do you plant no-till? How do you get cover crops into no-till systems? How can you diversify rotations? And what does that do to your, your, um, uh, to your input use and to your crop yields? Two things that farmers really do care about. And what he's basically found, and I, I, I tell, talk more about it in the book, but I took one example. He's got a whole bunch of research plots and examples. But by adopting the combination of no-till cover crops and complex rotations, those three principles of conservation agriculture, uh, he's greatly reduced inputs of diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide. And what I mean by greatly? Well, by more than half. And it depends on sort of the combination of practices. But that's a huge savings. So what did it do to the crop yields, to you know, the, the money a farmer could get off their fields? Well, their traditional yield went from you know, soybeans, 63 bushels an acre, to 79 once they introduced the complex rotation on top of these other uh, techniques. Corn yields also went up. In other words, the idea that you would lose yield by treating the soil better is a non-starter. You can actually, by improving the quality of your soil and using less chemical inputs and diesel, you can grow more food. Now, like I said, these guys are not organic farmers. So the whole argument over whether organic can feed the world, which is also a, a completely just a, a, a non-starter in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the yields at the Rodale Institute, uh, sort of long-term organic no-till uh, trials, they're as good as conventional. It's all about how, you, it's just like it's, you know, the, the yield problem with conventional agriculture is about how you, what your practices actually are. With organic, it's the same way. But you can have really high-yielding organic agriculture. This is Kofi Boa from the No-Till Center in Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, a gentleman that I visited uh, after I left uh, Dwayne, I basically said, well, Dwayne, so this works on your sort of high-tech North American farms. Would these methods, would these principles work in, on subsistence farms in Africa? He said, don't ask me, go ask Kofi Boa, he's done it. So I flew to Ghana and interviewed Kofi. He's an amazing gentleman uh, who has radically transformed farming practices in the area around his village uh, and near Kumasi. And part of the way is that you, um, they're growing a diversity of crops in the fields at the same time. So not so much in rotations as much as diversity all at once. And you'll notice there's no bare soil. It's basically no-till. Um, and the technology that the people that he's, or the farmers he's working with have at their disposal is pretty much hand labor. Um, what they call a cutlass, what I would call a machete since I grew up in California. Um, and they don't have access to, fertilize, to a large amounts of fertilizers or herbicides. They can buy some, but they don't have very much capital to be going into, to be investing in their farming practices. These are small-scale subsistence farmers. And the idea that you could sell them patented seeds 
or fertilizer intensive agriculture as a way to make a living is a complete non-starter because they don't have the capital to buy into it in the first place. Uh, so what's Kofi done? Uh, he has basically taken folks there from their traditional um, slash and burn practices, which when he was starting a few decades ago was the norm. And that can work really well when you have a lot of forest to clear and you can move your practices around, but when you start having a high enough population density and a low enough uh, forest reserve that you have to farm the same land year after year, that's a recipe for degrading your soil organic matter, for degrading your soil. What Kofi did is he took them straight to uh, no-till with cover crops, took them sort of left frog over the green revolution, and went straight to the soil health revolution, um, to <laughs> conservation agriculture. And what happened to their yields? Well, the traditional corn yield tripled. Yeah, you know, their corn yield tripled, their cowpea yield doubled. And it took less time and less expense <laughs> to actually grow food that way, once they had rebuilt the fertility of their soil. That's actually a really remarkable um, uh, advance and achievement. Uh, two farmers, I did, I fit to the number of farmers in North America. I'll mention Gabe Brown over here on the left and David Brandt over there on the right. Gabe is someone who has gone sort of one step further in terms of conservation agriculture and reintegrated livestock in his operations. And David Brandt is somebody who raises cover crops of daikon radishes in between his cash crops. He's a corn and soy farmer, that's what he sells. He grows a diverse mix of cover crops, including radishes, to, in his words, feed his livestock, which is all microbial. It's all below the ground. So when I told him what we would pay for this in the Seattle farmer's market, he may have been wishing he lived a little closer to Seattle. But he also basically said, look, I wouldn't sell that. That's the food for my livestock. That's, and so what he does is he relies on those radishes to dig deep, bring micronutrients out of the subsoil, get it into the topsoil when he then terminates that cover crop with a roller or, um, or whatever techniques he may use that year for terminating his cover crop, that organic matter gets into the topsoil where it then can get recycled into his cash crop. Um, what's that done for him in terms of his farming practices? And again, he's not an organic farmer. Um, he's a conventional farmer, but look at the economics on this. And also first, look at, at, at David's field, it's all green. Look at his neighbor's field, it's yellow. All the green, these are soybeans over here. This is his cover crop, so it's not in the direct comparison. But look at all that yellow. That's his soybean crop. The green, that's his neighbor's glyphosate resistant mare's tail. <laughs> the, the plants that are thriving in his conventional neighbor's fields are not the cash crop, it's the weeds. He doesn't have any weeds. He plants weeds. He has cover crops. He has, he has a diverse community of, of plants that he's planting that you might call a weed, but they're not. They're a cover crop. They're serving a role. They're getting nutrition out of the soil and in, uh, out of the deep soil and putting it into biological circulation. But look at the economics. So he's basically the county, you compare the county average practice where he lives near uh, in Carroll, Ohio, to, the, to David's 44 years of no-till with more recent adoption of cover crops and, and crop rotations. The total cost of its neighbors is about $500 an acre or so. Corn yield, two years ago when I visited, they got average on about 100 bushels an acre. At $4 a bushel, that amounts to a net loss of $100 per acre. What a great business model. <laughs> the harder you work, the more money you lose. And as I was researching this book, I came across a study from, I think it was the following year, maybe it was the same year, in Iowa, where a quarter of the farmers in Iowa, the place that has some of the best soil in the world, and some really high crop yields. About a quarter of the farmers there lost money on every acre they planted. Something is seriously wrong with modern agriculture. If really hardworking people in an area that has really fertile soil can you know, lose more money the harder they work, the more they try to grow. What Grant did, and, and the basic problem, of course, is that they're squeezed between <laughs> low commodity uh, crop prices, because they're so good at growing large amounts of things, and really high input costs for diesel and agrochemicals and seeds. That's the farmers that get caught in the middle. What Brad's doing with his 44 years of no-till with cover crops, um, oh, sorry, well, so what did these practices up here? Full tillage of the county average, 200 pounds of nitrogen an acre, a lot of fertilizer, two and a half quarts of Roundup per acre. What Brad uses is he doesn't till at all. He uses a little bit of nitrogen, about an eighth of what his neighbors are using, and he uses about a fifth of the Roundup. He's not organic, he just doesn't use many chemicals because he's found that after rebuilding the fertility of his soil, he doesn't need them. 
and he'd rather not spend the money on it if he doesn't need it. What does he get? He spends about 320 bucks an acre uh, on corn. He gets a yield that's you know, significantly better than his conventional neighbors. And at that same price where his neighbors lost 100 bucks an acre, he was profiting $400 an acre. That's a pretty compelling economic argument right there, that you can re if you regenerate the soil, you might be able to regenerate family farms. Grant's farm is not a large farm by American standards. But it's a very profitable one by the standards of his community. That is the kind of thing that started to give me a lot of optimism that we could really change around the future of agriculture because if it starts to make sense for farmers bottom line to practice a different style of agriculture, this may really catch on. Gabe Brown is the last farmer that I'll talk about. Uh, he's integrated livestock, his cattle grazes on his, his uh, cover crops, and then the chickens come along and graze on the things that live in the cattle poop. Um, and you can think of the livestock as a, um, a way to enhance and accelerate the breakdown of the organic matter that's in the cover crop and turn it into plant available nutrition faster. It's kind of like a, 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 a biological processing system. What's that done to his soil? This is Gabe's hands, and his right hand is a, some of his market garden soil, some of the best soil on, a, on his property, um, where he's used these techniques. The soil in his left hand is the organic soil, or the soil from his organic neighbor who tills. To me, this really captures the big difference. Because, you know, just look at the color difference between these. It's kind of like our yard. It's kind of like this, the slice that, that uh, Rattan, of Rattan allows long-term experiments. This is the, you know, the soil that a conventional farmer, using these unconventional practices that build soil health, can make over the course of a, of a decade or two, compared to his uh, tillage-based conventional neighbor. Um, this is where I think adopting all three of the principles of conservation agriculture really come into focus. And in, in Growing a Revolution, I summarized it with the, the, the tagline of ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity as the heart of the advice for how to rebuild soils around the world. Um, we, and if you think about what the philosophy behind modern conventional agriculture is, it's basically intensive tillage based with intensive uh, fertilizer and agrochemical use and growing monocultures. It is the exact opposite of all three of these principles. This is why I argue that we basically need to rethink agriculture from the ground up to pardon the stupid fun um, and think about how to adopt these principles to practices on different settings and different kinds of farms around the world. Because it's a really different way to think about the soil. And if we do that, I think we can actually harvest some really incredible benefits. You know, to varying degrees in varying uh, contexts. The kinds of benefits that I was seeing in visiting farmers who were practicing these principles of conservation agriculture were comparable or increased yields. I didn't find anyone who had a paid a yield penalty after the first couple years of transition. They needed to start rebuilding their soil fertility, um, so you had a couple years of depressed yield at the start. That is an issue for a transition. Um, but over the long run, they were comparable or increased. They greatly reduced their fossil fuel and pesticide use and their fertilizer use. This translated into um, higher farm profits and less pollution off-site. Um, and they also increased their soil carbon by a lot and retained, a lot, retained water a lot better in their soil. Those translate into crop resilience, which translate into farmer resilience. It's not really a question, uh, I think, of organic versus GMO and agrotech. That's a whole different argument. And it's an argument worth having. Um, and it's what this really is, is, I think, what I'd like to argue, is that these principles of conservation agriculture can be beneficial to farmers across the philosophical spectrum of those arguments. We should be doing it everywhere. And the term that I coined a growing revolution for these conventional farmers who had almost completely weaned themselves off of agrochemicals was that they were organic-ish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they may not be certified, they may not have the label, but they're very close. And whether they eventually decide to take the price premium and make even better profits, or they decide to let their kids do that when they take over the farm, <laughs> you know, that's, they're, they're right and they're privileged. But the idea that they could rebuild the health and fertility of their soil while still maintaining their ability to use some of those tools as they call agrochemicals, um, that, I think that could appeal to an awful lot of conventional farmers. Um, and if we could change conventional farming into organic-ish farming, 
we could literally change the world, because that's the majority of the world's farmers at present. You'd think, you know, 100 years ago, that wasn't the case. 1,000 years ago, everybody was an organic farmer. Practices can change, and we need to rethink things. We can also put a lot of carbon in the ground. Uh, I just like to use this slide near the end to basically say that some people have uh, argued that we could, you know, offset, you know, 10%-ish of global fossil fuel emissions with some very conservative, incredible um, estimates. Others have argued we could completely offset global fossil fuel estimates. There's a lot of argument about that. I actually, myself, am very skeptical whether the numbers pencil out at that level. But the point I want to make is that there's a huge range. This is the entire game. And what I've just been talking about, I mentioned carbon at the end very intentionally. We should be doing these things whatever the carbon benefit. We should take the carbon benefit, and I think it could be very large and very beneficial. And we could even pay farmers to put more carbon in the land. That would accelerate adoption of these practices. But we should be doing this anyway. So how do we promote it? You know, there's some ideas up there. The, the, the Farm Bill in 2018 is going to be on the table. There will be some ideas about regenerative agriculture being kicked around in D.C. Write your Congress people. Call them. Agitate. Yeah, you know, if you have opinions about this, the time to make them known is as the farm bill is, is negotiated. Uh, because reforming crop insurance and subsidy programs would be huge. Uh, we need to establish more demonstration farms like Dwayne Beck's uh, farm and, and Kofi Boa's farm. And we need to provide, I think, some transition assistance. It would be a very good investment, long-term investment in agriculture, to not to continue to subsidize practices that degrade and destroy the soil. But instead, let's assist farmers in transitioning to regenerative practices so that they can then be set in a more, set themselves up more resiliently and profitably. And finally, what would all this do? You know, it would, it would help us feed the world. It could help us sequester carbon. It would help with environmental degradation and pollinator issues. And a key selling point, I think, in the political arena is it could help restore farm profitability to small farms across America. And that could help revitalize you know, rural communities across America. This is one of the big downsides of the modernization of agriculture in North America in the, well, in the developed world in the last century and a half, is that farmers have literally been squeezed in the middle. And this would help. Uh, so naturally, I will recommend all three books assigned to the <laughs> uh, 